Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of the Jams D Podcast where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And this week we are going to be coming at you like we do every single week. We have two new records, new-ish records in this week's instance. This is the last main episode of the Jams D Podcast for 2021. Oh my God, we made it. We are going to be talking about one album which is new which is the comeback album from progressive metal band cynic their album ascension codes their first album in a long fucking time and we are also going to be talking about the triple split lp between paranool uh so fucking you're gonna have to say this for me so i don't fuck it up Fucking right. Son Hos Tomam Conta I think you and Asian yeah. Glow. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be talking about Downfall of the Neon Youth. Uh, right. We've right. covered the other Paranormal Project this year. Uh, we liked it a fair bit. So, mm. yeah. Um, Zane, before you probably have noticed that it's just me and Jake, August will be joining us later on. He's running a bit late, but he'll be joining us for those two main reviews today. Uh, Morgan is in the death throes of finals week. So Morgan has, is deservingly taking a week off in the podcast uh, this week, but he will be back rejoining us for our list videos, which will be starting uh, next weekend. So yeah, stick around for those. But anyway, Jake and I can get into, in the meantime, what we have been listening to. Before we do that, though, a couple of shout outs mm-hmm. worth shouting out. Uh, just the other day, I put out a, well, we put out a highlight reel that I edited, the last of a trilogy of highlight reels that I've worked on throughout the year, specifically covering the 2020 season, as I call it, of Jams and Tea, uh, where we were kind of just starting out as a podcast and still sort of like pretty formless, a lot of our episodes and not really editing ourselves all that much really the succession season one of the jams and tea podcast whereas 2021 is the succession season two i think yeah and the reason i did like i decided to make it like a 2020 series in the end was like it felt to me like the end of that year was really the moment like started this year was really the moment where i think the jams and tea podcast really like started to click into focus and we started to really like uh, I got a lot more better, a lot better at editing, and we just got a lot better at pacing our episodes. And so the 2020 series was like a really unkempt um, section of videos. And so now the best moments of those are isolated into really fun highlight reels that you can check out. We'll put a link to the new video and to the playlist in the description below. So check that out if you haven't already. And we have lots of fun, exciting content coming your way this month. I don't want to spoil oh, yeah too much because we're going to leave it to be a bit of a surprise and we'll announce it a few days beforehand but we have some content coming that will be let's just say outside the world of music criticism and we'll just leave it at that um but for now let's get into what we've been listening to in the last week jake what have you been listening to uh well i have been listening to a lot of things for uh upcoming content later uh this month uh if you are a fan of whenever this podcast talks about opeth we might have a little something for you in the near future uh that's all i'll say about that um the the sort of peter jackson beatles documentary has kept like beatles discourse going in in full heft uh, so naturally, I've kept up my listening. I listened to my favorite Beatles project like three times the whole way through, um, which is funny just because it's the longest uh, project that is related to the Beatles, that being George Harrison's album solo effort, uh, All Must Pass, or All Things Must Pass, um, which I think is a stone cold perfect record, um, which is all the more incredible when you consider that it's a fucking massive double album. Uh, and yeah, I mean, like, that's just kind of one of those things where it's like, it, it it just, it makes me feel warm and happy inside. Like, it's one of those, like, it's like a comfort album just because I associate the Beatles music with a lot of my childhood and all of the, like, it feels like George Harrison, as I, the older I get, I've realized that, or at least artistically speaking, George is probably my favorite Beatle because of his contributions being, like, very, like, elemental simple but also like the easiest to wrap your head around and the most like spiritually inclined and that's sort of what all things must pass uh is 
is that it's an album that's about like George's particular brand of spiritualism. It's, you know, him in full hippie mode talking about love and shit for a long time uh, through some of the best songs ever written. The title track, um, Hear Me Lord, uh, fucking just basically just some of the best songs that anybody ever wrote all amalgamated into one album experience and it's it's an all killer no filler album which it exceeds an hour and you don't get many of those it's one of my favorite albums ever i feel like i love it more each time i listen to it which it feels almost impossible at this point but um uh, shout out to uh, one song, uh, Isn't It a Pity, which I consider to be uh, John Lennon's Imagine If It Was a Good Song. Uh, it, it, it's a uh, hundred percent less condescending and annoying and a hundred percent more musically interesting and lyrically compelling so good on you george uh, i'm sorry that they forgot about you in those last two beatles albums and people were like it's so sad i see the beatles documentary and it's like george is just like there's like that meme that's just like the they don't know i'm and then it's like like somebody put george's head over it's like they don't know i'm leaving the band and it's just like everybody else doing their own thing and poor george is just they're like because he's like competing with the egos of, of John and Paul the entire time and Ringo's just happy to be there so you know give it up for poor George uh dude, dude was talented and uh, he was a bit taken for granted in his time yeah I re-listened to two albums from a black gaze project that I'm particularly fond of that we haven't talked about on here yet just because they haven't come out with a new album since the podcast has come out and, uh, but I really want to change that. Uh, hopefully they'll have a new album in the coming year just because it's a, it's about that time. But uh, the French black metal band, I'll say, and by uh, French black metal band, I mean one fucking guy who is miraculously behind most of the music of this band uh, has an amazing 2010s run of albums, just like absolutely undefeated. Like the worst of which is still like, a solid great album in the form of shelter but i listened to their most recent project which is spiritual instinct um kodama is another one i listened to that one's my favorite um but spiritual instinct is interesting just because it's a little bit less heavy on the emphasis of like atmosphere and what have you and it's a bit more like just kind of like goes it's like if uh kodama is their sunbather is their um uh fucking what's the other death heaven album that i'm trying to think of um ordinary corrupt human love no infinite granite no new bermuda new bermuda thank you go. it's their <laughs> new bermuda um maybe not a great place to get into them just because it is a bit of an outlier in their discography but if it's something that like if you like your black metal to be a little bit more punchy and aggressive like especially the drumming on that album is like really harsh really blistering it's a little bit less textural than it is in other black metal projects and the band uh as a whole but there's really no bad place to start with them even if you start with shelter which is their weakest album in my opinion that still sets up a great like it, it sets up a great foundation for their sound and every album after that that you listen to is in my opinion better so you'll get to like continually discover them but there's also um Escalier de Lune, which is uh, French for Scales of the Moon, which is fucking outstanding. I, um, I still haven't heard Kadama or Spiritual Incest. What is it? Spiritual... <laughs> spiritual Incest. Oh, no. I forgot. Sorry. Spiritual Instinct. Instinct. Uh, I, still <laughs> I still haven't heard those two. But um, so that's that's a big caveat. But Ekai de Lune is my favorite um, I'll say record that I have heard. I, I'm really, really it's familiar fantastic. with their older stuff. Um, and then I listened, to, I listened to Shelter when it came out because that was when I was going through my big sort of black gaze phase. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed that well enough, but kind of drifted off after that. Mm -hmm. So I really, really need to get back into those later era, I'll say, records because I, I, I know I'm missing out. I can... Yeah, I, I, I will say I do ride hard for their debut Memories from Another World. I think that album's fantastic. Um, but... Uh, you know, uh, Sky Deloon might be one well, of the stay is your favorite just because that is like that. I'd say that's probably my second favorite of theirs as it stands right now. But I need to like really properly listen to their uh, the rest of their discography. But I do think like Kodama is a really important album to me. Like that was the album that got me into Black Gaze in the first place back in 2016. And um, yeah, that that's one that I think everybody should hear. It's like one of the most 
tightly formed black metal albums that is like come up in that particular movement but it's also expansive and beautiful it's like like when i heard it for the first time i genuinely just didn't know how to feel about it just because i'd never heard anything like it before it was like drawing from post metal and shoegaze and black metal and all of these things and it was something that just blew my mind and i love it to this day um Oh, one thing I definitely need to mention is that there is a new album from uh, an artist who Tyler has shouted out here before, which is Richard Dawson. Uh, Richard Dawson and uh, the uh, band Circles have collaborated together and made a new album called Henke. Um, and if you're familiar with the kind of stuff that Richard Dawson does, the sort of folk prog, uh, very heavy emphasis on storytelling, uh, kind of like shtick that he has, this very much follows in that same vein is that this album is a collection of sort of, it's kind of like an anthology uh, that's like very mythic that has to do with lots of legends, lots of Greek mythology stuff. So, I mean, of course I'm interested in it. And uh, this is my first Richard Dawson project. And... I'm really impressed with this. Uh, this is uh, probably going to edge in on my favorite albums of the year list fairly highly uh, as it stands. I need to give it a few more spins, but as it is, it's cracked my top 20 pretty confidently. Um, this thing is heat front to back. Uh, there is not a weak moment on here. Uh, every single song has the just like again that really really interesting um lyricism and storytelling that's always like you know you always kind of run the risk of when you have these albums where it's like each song is like a story you kind of run the risk of being like repetitive in some respect or if your storytelling chops aren't good enough you might not be able to really flesh it out or make it dynamic enough to make you feel like you're listening to something new uh and thankfully Dawson has a, a really like an interesting sense of humor and also just sort of like an interesting way of making all of these stories feel very distinct and very individual and just and with the band behind him here uh circles this like the way this sounds is amazing there's like a point on like the third track here where it basically turns into a deep cut from the mars voltus francis the mute and it sounds like miranda that ghost isn't holy anymore uh and like all of the like the progginess of this folk album is really accentuated. It's really like muscular. Uh, and it's just really it, it, like for an album that's really not like, you know, uh, uh, like fast paced or anything. It's something that's like really continuously dense and exciting. And uh, I, I really, really enjoyed that project. It's, it's really, really good. I highly recommend it. I haven't um, listened to this one yet, but I will just say on the note of Richard Dawson, um, like that storytelling approach, that uh, anthology of stories you're speaking of is very true of his previous mm -hmm. records also, Peasant and 2020, both of which incidentally would make my top 50 albums of the decade list. Uh, a sensational oh, yeah. singer songwriter, um, and great at like taking that really, really powerful, potent storytelling and then putting it in the context of these instrumentals that are just so like not what you would expect and so like gloriously unhinged and crazy and awesome. Um, yeah, I, I can't recommend his other music enough. I'm definitely, definitely going to make an effort to really listen to this album a few times before I finalize my best albums of the year list because there's definite potential for it to make mine too, considering how much I love him as a songwriter. Oh, yeah. I think both Tyler and August, I think that's a very them core record. I'm going to run through a bunch of like things really, really quick here just so I can sort of get to the point. Um, but I finished up the discography of Bjork that I've been going through. Um, Bjork good. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm really, really happy I made that plunge just because I finally fully connected with her as an artist. And I, uh, well, I've got one question just, for you, Jake. What did you think of hmm. Volta? Because everyone says that's her worst album. Um, I don't even think I would rate it terrifically differently than some of like the lower tier Bjork stuff that I've heard. Um, that said, I think the sort of there, there's a couple things holding it back. There's the sort of lack of unification in concept that I feel albums like Medulla, albums like Utopia, albums like um, Biophilia undeniably have uh, that just isn't really there. Like Volta is just sort of an album that feels like a collection of songs, which, you know, is fine. Uh, but I don't really love 
the production on it, which is weird for a Bjork album because I mostly do uh, elsewhere. And honestly, a lot of the stuff on here, and, and when it pertains to like the worldliness and the, the environmental themes on Volta, a lot of it comes across as kind of like awkward and clunky, which is again, strange just because Bjork is an odd like lyricist when it comes to this kind of stuff. But it's like, I kind of think she just did all that shit better on Biophilia. Whereas on Volta, it's like, I don't want to say it comes off as like sloganeering, but it kind of does <laughs> like a little bit. There's some songs where you're just kind of like, I don't know, maybe another redraft in the in the drawing room. But like, there's still highlights on it. There, it's an album that's like worth listening to. I was expecting it to be like a dud, but like, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that much. Um, but yeah, Bjork good. Um, I listened to a shitload of albums to fill out my albums of the year, worst albums of the year list. So look forward to that. Um, I listened to a Stars of the Lit album because I'm going through lots of ambient projects for whatever reason. I just really got that like feverish. I think it started off by the fact that I listened to Panda Bear's um, Person Pitch, uh, which because of, you know, your Animal Collective thing, which I loved. Person Pitch. Great album. Um, bros one of the best animal collective related songs I've heard so far um, I really want to keep coming back to this album just because it's really really dense and I just it really just put me in a really good state of mind I, I can't I'm trying to try and blow through the rest of the animal collective discography before the end of the year um, but that was really cool I listened to the the stars of the lit album I listened to was per aspera ad astra which you know it's no um, the tired sound of stars is the lid, but then again, what is? Uh, but this album is a little bit more succinct. It's a little bit tighter, uh, and it's really, really great. Really, really dense. Great shit. Um, I listened to maybe this. This is if I can like you know for ambient heads out there. Um, big, big recommendation to a discovery I made um, by an ambient artist named Michael Stearns. Uh, S T E A R N S. Uh, this dude has a shitload of projects that he's made over the years. Um, like, and I'm pretty sure he's still working today. And he has an album. Uh, I've listened to a couple of his stuff, but the one I want to point out here is Planetary Unfolding, which is a flawless record. A flawless record. It's like a very, like, space ambient kind of album again uh my favorite kinds of this music are shit like um uh the the sort of work that maybe um harold budd has done in the past shit like the pearl which is my current favorite ambient album it's it's it, it's it's a journey it's a it's a it's a fascinating record i haven't heard anybody talk about it and it is utterly fucking transcendent, a flawless piece of music. Um, I also listened to an album by uh, the artist Candy Claws, uh, a shoegaze uh, band. I listened to Ceres and Calypso in Deep Time, which is great, uh, super, super great. Um, don't hear anybody talk about this album. I'm pretty sure this is big Rimcore music. So it, It's big uh, music, Twitter and Rimcore, absolutely. It's all like the kids are really into this album. Yeah, it's, it's really dense. It's really interesting. I really, really like it. Um, and uh, the last, oh, I, I listened to, there's sort of like a indie folktronica ambient project by an artist called Two, number two, Muchachos, funny, uh, called Forest is Not What It Seems. Uh, and this is this weird kind of... Um, Honestly, I very much compare it to the work of Angelo Badalamenti, and I don't say that just because of the owl and the obvious Twin Peaks reference from the title here, but if you really like Angelo Badalamenti's soundtrack for Twin Peaks and you want something that's like dark and eerie, please go for that. Totally 100% worth your time. And the last ambient thing I will shout out is Heresy by the project Lust Mord, L-U-S-T-M-O-R-D. Um, another ambient project that's very long-standing. This album sounds like galaxies ending. This sounds like the world being engulfed in an all-consuming fiery apocalypse. It's droney, it's heavy, it's dark, and it's fucking awesome. I've had a good new week for listening. Hell yeah. 
that sounds uh, and a, like five albums you've shouted out there i've never heard of before and immediately want to go and put on so i know right as fuck yeah um so i'll was really quickly through uh things of note that i've been listening to recently uh, jake sort of kicked off by mentioning the recent beatles documentary get back which i still haven't watched i hope to get to Me that either. at some point um but it's a really big fucking task so we'll see what happens um hopefully get to that later in the month but I did want to sort of, it made me, as I'm sure it has for a lot of people, want to go back to some of their music and, and some of the music of theirs that I was have, have been less intimately familiar with and revisit it. Particularly, of course, Let It Be, which is the album that Get Back, the documentary, tracks the recording of. And their last released album, though of course every Beatles fan will be jumping to tell you that Abbey Road was recorded after it. But anyway, <laughs> Let It Be, curious record always had a really fractious relationship with it i know jake that this is a record that means a lot to you and probably has a lot of childhood nostalgia to you as well so i came into it this week wanting to really like you know have it click and i revisited the original recording and i have to say i share a lot of the general complaints that have been lobbed at it over the years mostly that um the production of phil specter smothers certain tracks on the album um particularly you really killed it what can i say <laughs> yes uh particularly the long and winding road and across the universe which are two of my favorite sort of songs that, that are there but are absolutely kind of like clouded um with his sort of really uh indulgent sort of string arrangements and production that said uh i did also listen to the paul mccartney re-release of this album let it be naked where he kind of restructured the record and kind of fixed the production in his opinion though it should be noted that john lennon and ringo Starr both vocally said that they liked phil Spector's mix of the record yeah. so that should be noted but i have to say john I'm lennon i believe said he took all our shitty songs and made them better like, yeah, he, he, he said that in, in 1970 which is of course <laughs> at the time where he was like you know shitting on his band at the most highest level God, but um he really was but um but yeah like i definitely agree with I, I definitely side with paul here in the sense that i think that let it be works better as an album in this re-released arrangement not just because i think the those tracks that have that phil Spector production that, that are improved but also because I think the track sequencing makes a lot more sense, particularly like having Get Back as the opener instead of Two of Us, which is a lovely song, but doesn't work as well as an opener into the record. Um, that said, the other big advantage to Let It Be Naked is that it includes Don't Let Me Down, which is my favorite song from the whole sessions Don't of this record. Me I mean, probably a top 10 Beatles song. I mean, again, like oh, yeah. a lot of hot takes fly around about John Lennon. And look, I get it, but his voice and his songwriting on a track like this, absolutely unbeatable. Absolutely unbeatable. He sounds he, he amazing. He still wrote so many of the best Beatles songs. Unquestionably. Like, I like, mean, like, In My Life is like top three Beatles songs, and that's all there is to it, frankly. There have definitely been stages in my life where he's been my favorite Beatle, and of course the joy of the Beatles is that that can change depending on the stage of your life you're at, depending on you know, you know, where you are and that sort of thing it's never necessarily a fixed thing. Like I nah. I used to be like you, I had George as my hardcore favorite, you know, John is my hardcore favorite. Currently I'm, I'm a Paul guy, but you know, it, it could it could totally flip. George uh, and Paul are just sort of our speed, I think. I think yeah. respectively, you and I definitely like, you have major Paul energy and I have major George energy. <laughs> I guess, I, that's very flattering actually. Um, but yeah, I, Long and Winding Road, I think is a super underrated song. Sounds, it, excellent on the naked version um there are some songs i still don't love that much like i have to be honest and say that i find for you blue to be kind of irritating there's like the sound in it i yeah. can't even remember now and it just really bugs me that said some really celebrated deep cuts on this record like i me mine and i've got a feeling yeah. that um deserve the love that they get um and i think the finishing the record with let it be the title track is a smart choice in this case as well so yeah uh i, I i'm pleased to say that by experiencing the naked version i have improved my you know opinion on this album uh, i also 
put the time into revisiting another seminal Beatles record that is one of the ones I spent less time with comparatively, that being Magical Mystery Tour. Of course, the reason why I don't listen to this record Banger. is because it's a short record that has so many ubiquitous songs on it that you never really, I don't necessarily find the desire to listen to it in full because I just know the song so well. Oh, yeah. Totally. I will share the general sentiment that it's kind of a backloaded album, um, but I do really, really enjoy, obviously, the title track, Fall on the Hill, classic, classic Beatles mm. song. I think the rest of the A-side is kind of middling in comparison. I don't really care for I Am the Walrus, um, but the second yeah, half fine. of this record, you know, back to back, brilliant. Hello, Goodbye, and Baby, You're a Rich Man, I think are really underrated songs. Uh, Strawberry Fields Forever is as absolutely as good as its reputation would suggest. And Penny Lane, my favorite yes. song on the album. Um, amazing. Yep. So, yeah, really, really solid. Really enjoyed spending a day with um, those records. Uh, I also listened to the kind of critical darling record of the year, which is a sophista pop album called Ignorance by a project called The Weather Station. This was a February album, um, and I kind of just overlooked it at the time. Um, but now that I've kind of gotten more into sophista pop, into bands like um, Prefab Sprout and The Blue Nile, which both of those bands, this band, uh, resembles quite strongly, I wanted to revisit this. And yeah, it's very pleasant. It's very gorgeous sounding at certain points. It's in one ear, out the other type of stuff, though. It does, didn't really leave a huge mm. impact on me, but it looks like it's a critical darling and it's going to potentially top a lot of critics' lists. So I wanted to check it out anyway. Um, I also listened to, well, I re-listened to two albums from the legendary Hobo Johnson, The Rise of Hobo Johnson and The Fall of Hobo Johnson. Uh, oh, and I will no, say yes. The Rise of Hobo Johnson, terrible, terrible album, uh, the Fall of Hobo Johnson, less bad. In fact, has two songs on it that I actually quite like, two of the singles from that record. And I remember when that record came out in 2019 and I enjoyed those singles quite a bit. It was like, that was the version of Hobo Johnson that was the least irritating and the most tuned to his strengths. Although that said, it's still a woefully uneven album and has a lot of bad stuff on it. The Revenge of Hobo Johnson. I'm not going to say a single word on this album because I it's unquestionably going to feature in our worst albums of the year list. And I'm I, I elected not to mention Hobo Johnson alienates his fan base for a very particular reason, because yeah. I'm going to talk about it eventually. Yeah. There's going to be a segment in our worst list called the, 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 the 2021 releases of Hobo Johnson. And we'll just save it for that. Um, That's his yeah. next album. The uh, Jams and T podcast reviews Hobo Johnson. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> genuinely, that would be the highlight of my life. How sad is that? A, a track against each one of us individually. That, that, would be, that? That, would, that would be the best I, thing ever. I would quite fucking honestly. shit myself. Oh, uh, one more thing I'll shout out really quickly uh, is I have started listening to the plague of releases that Arca has unleashed upon us this week with the oh yeah uh, with the with the I guess full release of her kick anthology five albums the first of which was released last year we reviewed it last year i revisited that still love that album i started listening to the rest of them but i'm not going to speak on it because jake and i are toying with the idea of doing a video on this series i know that i definitely am keen to but i've got to actually finish listening to the albums first so um for those of you who are arca fans we probably well almost certainly won't be covering it in the formal podcast capacity but we will be talking about it in some detail so um look out for that at a later date august yeah you have anything you want to shout out that you've been listening to in the last seven days um well this week i uh I started it off by listening to uh, something that our friend Connor had listened to, that being Earache Records released Earache, the world's shortest album. And uh, wow, it really was the world's shortest album. How long is it? It's like a minute 27. <laughs> Is it, is it just like, like like 10 versions of that Napalm Death song? It, it's like it's that second? Napalm Death song and a bunch of other similar songs. Wait, what? Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, see. It's like, got that was a fucking joke. I didn't got, know it was actually It's there. got Napalm Death. It's got Anal what? Cunt. It's got Morbid Angel. Oh, Anal Cunt. Uh, Everyone's yeah. favorite. Yeah. I mean, the joke's funny for like 15 seconds, which happens oh, no. to be... Uh, I mean, fortunately, it's not long, but it's like I was kind of <laughs> smiling. I was kind of smiling for like the first couple seconds, and then it's like, oh, yeah, sure. Whatever. August thoughts on the world's shortest album. Well, it's not long. 
it's not long I, lo- I love some of these song titles like um they're so good oh dear. like uh, there's of course the album opens with you suffer but then there's a great track from worm rock called you suffer but why is it my problem <laughs> which i love <laughs> and then my the best song title here abs- unquestionably anal cunts highlight wind chimes are gay yeah Fucking like yeah. faggy wind chimes. I, I will say the, the weirdest thing about this album is the insect warfare song Street Sweeper that ends the album actually feels long by the time you've been conditioned to people just going <laughs> <laughs> and then the song ending. Like I'm I'm literally gonna put up on the screen the track links for this album so that people can understand that like all but Two of these songs are less than 10 seconds. And this this is a real thing. And I listened to it, and now I will never think about it again. Simply, I, I, I suggest simply listen to the grindcore section of John Zorn's Naked City instead. I have been meaning to listen to more Zorn, so hell yeah. Uh, from uh, Stars of the Lid, I listened to uh, Gravitational Pull, versus the desire for an aquatic life. This is their uh, sophomore record. And uh, I Mason showed me a lot of Stars of the Lid songs before, and I had never listened to a proper album of theirs. And this is one of their shorter ones. It's, you know, only an hour long. So uh, I know, big difference from the world's shortest album. Um, what did you but think this, of it? Uh, I enjoyed it. Most of the songs weren't bad. They were all actually pretty good drone songs. I, I really liked the mood it conveyed. Although there were some tracks that were it felt like they had significantly less time spent on them than others. Even though it is a very minimal project, it is clear where their, uh, what baskets they put their eggs in in terms of the creation of this album. I think uh, it, it should be said yeah. that one of the reasons why this record is a little bit probably underbaked is that they were hard at work on their first opus, which is 1997's The Ballasted Orchestra, which is definitely an 80 minute album. So, you know, a bit hard, maybe a bit harder to find the time. Still one of their shorter albums, but um, definitely I think a record where they capitalize on the sound they build with gravitational pull much more thoughtfully, if I can say yeah. that. That that would uh, that would be interesting to see then. I also listened to Stars of the Lid this week, August. It seems that we are on the same wavelength. Yeah. I, it should be said I also listened to uh, William Bezinski's Water Music 2, which is uh, one of his earlier experiments with just time as a form, more so than like m- the music itself. That being said, I think the actual looping drone itself is very pretty and I made it through the uh, 66 minute runtime quite easily uh, but yeah that that uh, song album I think is really effective uh, great background stuff uh, I mean I think he's done better but it's also still very very good and I guess the final thing I'll mention is from the post-punk revival band editors, I listened to The Back Room. Uh, this is a... Uh, this a is childhood a favorite song. of mine. Yeah. It's very all over the place. There are as many forgettable, generic post-punk songs as there are absolutely blood-pumping bone chilling amazing ones munich like munich blood all sparks bullets that's just those are just four friggin amazing songs and then the rest of it is very scattershot editors are like the most bland band that i really like (laughs) and it's kind of hard to justify the thing about editors is that their whole shtick, particularly on the back room, is just a complete ripoff of Interpol's first album. So 
Interpol's first album is The Back Room with much more consistent songwriting and much better instrumental presence generally. So I think you'd really like that record. But that said, The Back Room is still an album that has a special place in my heart because I went through a phase where the, the sound of that album, just the kind of like blood pumping, uh, real kind of basics, uh, post-punk rock, I was just super into that for a long time yeah. uh, when I was like 18. And so I like became obsessed with the editors. They're a fun band to listen to, I will say. I mean, I'm not going to pretend it's like some super, like it, it's like a six or a seven album, but I'd still say it's like worth listening to enough just because there's some really great moments on it. Even if others like, I don't know, like, camera is so boring. I will say, and this will not surprise you in the slightest, August, it's comfortably their best album. <laughs> Oof. Oof. Although their second album has some really great songs on it. It's yeah. just much more uneven. So, Yeah, that's about all I've been listening to. Well, in that case, let's get quickly into our first album review of the week, and that is... The new album from Cynic, Ascension Codes. Now, August, why don't you give us the context we need to understand why this is sort of a significant slash anticipated release for Cynic? Um, I know there's certain information with regard to the backstory of the band in the last few years that's quite important. And then you can kind of get into um, what you think of the record and how you think it holds up in comparison. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, quick introduction for those who don't know. Cynic are an American metal band, I will call them, because they, they are very dedicated to the idea of not necessarily slotting themselves into any one genre within the metal sphere. They've got progressive elements, death metal elements, thrash metal elements. They're a very fascinating band and have a, an incredibly unique sound. But the context for as to where this album comes from and why I was so hotly anticipating it was, uh, I mean, first off, it is their first release in a good, I wanna say seven years at this point. And tragedy kind of struck this album when the founding member and longtime drummer of the band, uh, Sean Reinhardt, had died in early 2020, unfortunately. Yikes. And as if that wasn't insulting enough, the band's uh, longtime bass player, Sean Malone, passed away 11 months later. Also in 2020. God, bad year to be a dude named Sean and Cynic. Good God. Yeah. Uh, so this, this this album was kind of set up to be this thing that was going to be rife with personal tragedy and kind of the band's front man and really the person who has been the only consistent member of Cynic throughout its uh, existence, Paul Masvidal. Uh, I think that's how you say his name. I'm not sure. Yep. Uh, he, uh, this channel has covered some of projects that Paul has covered or been on, notably Death's Human, which we are a big fan of and a big fan of Paul's contributions to that album. Well, that, that album is essentially the formation of Cynic as well, because Sean Reinhardt yes. is on that record as well, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. that record was essentially the birth of this of this band that then went on made the classic album Focus and the rest. Classic of album Focus. Uh, but I guess and, uh, and a little more to the context here. Mm. Masvidal said in interviews leading up to this album that he was going to fundamentally shake up Cynic's sound because of how essential the two Sean's contributions to the band were. And what he has graced us with is an album that takes a very uh, space rock kind of new agey a lot more, I'd say, English progressive rock inspired sound than 
definitely anything they've done previously, which was much more American metal. And as for my actual thoughts on the record, um, this was a bit of a disappointment, if I'm entirely honest with myself. Um, one criticism I can foresee coming at this album is the uh, very thin presence of the guitar in the mix and how, uh, how this is not really a guitar album. And to a sense, I understand that because Cynic's whole brand up to this point have been pushing the envelope in terms of the production of metal, like a what class, what you can even constitute as a, a metal album with focus, like having these very strange ethereal vocals that sounded what, like what would, what a vocoder would do in just 10 years time. And then Traced in Air takes that same sound and amps it up to those vocals just straight up being vocoded and even dropping out traditional death metal growls. But the point is their sound has always been on the fringe of being very unconventional and boundary pushing. So going into this and hearing this for the first time, I did not inherently have a problem with the way this was produced. What I have an issue with is the end result because what we have here is a collection of Cynic's most immemorable tracks to date, I think. It, it really emphasizes how important the, the muscle and the ferocity was to their sound, because even though they are very ethereal and out there typically in their presentation and sound, this album takes that so far to the point of sounding unfinished, under half-baked, like a, a half measure at points. I mean, a lot, and this is definitely not helped by the fact that there are a good eight, like 18 songs on here, nine of which are 30 second long filler tracks, which kind of fill in the gaps between here. And where this becomes most egregious are points where they'll be placed right after one another, which, uh, no. <laughs> I think the um, biggest problem with them is that I don't even an, an issue with the idea of them, like the idea of crafting an album experience where they kind of like, you know, are interstitial and kind of become a part of this wider picture. But the biggest problem is that they kill the flow and pacing oh they're so the bad in that way. like you have a really like sometimes and i i do think that there are tracks on here that are considerably better than other tracks like i think there are a couple of tracks yes. on here that i would call really strong but their overall impact in the context of the album is is dampened when you have them being separated by these just pointless clouds of ambience which i get have a point and i'll get into it when it's my turn but they really disrupt the pacing in a way that I find really egregious. August, you yeah. had a problem with an EP of theirs, I believe, that you spoke about on this show that had a similar uh, problem? Yes. Um, that EP being Carbon-Based Anatomy, which that album does the same idea, but I think much better because those ambient pieces are far more fleshed out. Like, those are proper two and a half minute tracks. And even that was a bit of a hampering to their overall sound. So, I mean, the idea for this kind of project is not even necessarily unprecedented within Cynic's back catalog. It's just the end result, while it does have some, I think properly amazing Cynic songs on here. Like I'll give a, I'll give a shout out to a couple, I think to the, few tracks I think are really good. I think the opening tone setter, the winged ones is quite sublime. That's it's a song really on good book. track. Oh yeah, it's so good. I think uh, Architects of Consciousness is has some really powerful, fun, properly invigorating moments. Second best song on the album. <laughs> I, I like how I'm, how I'm, we're just on the same wavelength here. 
And uh, I think sixth dimensional archetype is also quite, quite good and keeping, and that's actually sixth dimensional archetype into DNA activation template, even though DNA activation template is a, of a song, just a fucking nothing of a song, quite honestly. Worst song on the album. Worst song on the yes. album, unquestionably. Uh, yes. They, like, and it's such a waste because that's the one moment where you have two like fully developed ideas right next to each other. And yep. one's actually not bad. And then the other's just, ooh. I like how Yeesh. it like decides to be a song like at the very end for a little bit. And then it, it has like this. Yeah. I thought that was the ambient piece of this <laughs> song. I had to like look and I was like, oh, it's the same. Oh, okay. And I, that this is all to say, I don't think this project is necessarily terrible. And it is not without purpose even. Like there is a clear artistic motivation to this that I see and think is interesting. Mm. And like even the, and I think the idea of combining electronic synthesizers with metal and creating an end product is not a bad idea on its face. They, they've done it brilliantly it. in the past. And they've done it brilliantly. And even I, I think we're all a fan of Trace and Air to a yeah. pretty significant extent, um, frankly. Say it with me, kids. Their best album. In their best album. It's it's in my top 25 of all time, so listen to it if you haven't. Uh, it's literally 36 minutes long. Fucking <laughs> listen to August. Yeah, but... <sighs> Man, I'm just disappointed is really the end verdict here. I think I can maybe give this album, because I, I feel pretty similarly to you, August. I don't think it's terrible. In fact, I will say I've listened to it three times now, and each time I've liked it a little bit more than the last time. Like I've, I've started to appreciate it a little bit more, but it's definitely got a ceiling for me. Um, but I can kind of see the concept itself. And, and th so this is an album that's very clearly defined by the absence of the Shawns. Like the fact that they are no longer in the band, like that is a key part of, I think, what Mas Vidal is approaching the record with philosophically in terms of like what his aim, uh, in terms of the things he wants to communicate and the ideas and the emotions in here in this record and the reason why he has it sound the way that it does. The reason why it is this album that's kind of like, an anti-heavy record in the sense that it's, it's a, a real injustice for all type situation. Well, it's like it's a metal record with all the heft of a metal record stripped out of it yeah. and made into this kind of like spacey, as you say, thing. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea. And I think, as you've already mentioned, there are moments on this record, particularly the winged ones, where that musical concept is realized quite beautifully and a lot of it is because you have some really strong performers on this record yes the, the two shawns are absent but i think it would be worth shouting out the players who fill their places the drummer matt lynch and the synthesizer keyboard player dave mckay who both have oh, yeah. moments on this record where you know they aren't sean reinhardt and sean malone but they do their downest and i think that the winged ones showcases each player in this new iteration of Cynic at their best. You have the drumming is really I mean, strong from yeah. Matt. The synthesizer work is really strong from Dave. There Mackay, are no frankly, here. holds the vast majority of this album up. I was going to say, I think Dave Mackay is a particularly great synthesizer and keyboard player. Like, it, uh, yeah. I find his craft really exceptional. He has great sort of synthesizer solo parts and just general synthesizer uh, additions throughout this record, particularly on Architects of Consciousness, which I think is where he sounds at the best on the whole record. Uh, really, really great stuff. In fact, I would say if I were to break this down, all the performers are doing a really good job on this record. It's the production and the whole approach to the way the sound of this record is constructed that sometimes really, really holds it back, sometimes takes, takes the, the weight out of it and doesn't give you enough to sufficiently appreciate its dreaminess, its spaciousness as a musical concept. And so it, it, it's like, it's almost a case of not really fully committing to that. Like it, it, in one sense, it wants to be this space rock progressive thing. On the other hand, it still wants to have those shades of their progressive metal 
you know, more intense and rhythmically complicated style. And you have a push-pull between these two um, directions, the past of Cynic and this new era of Cynic. And it, it, it leaves the record feeling like unrealized and lacking the kind of identity that I think it's clearly trying to seek out. And that really um, hobbles it, I think, in a lot of ways. But like, I don't... I don't want to be too strongly negative because I, I do think there's a lot to appreciate about this record. I think that it is a record that gets better the more attention that you give it and it has some really great performances on it, really great playing on it. I'm not here to come out and say Musfi Dial has lost it. He can't make good records anymore. You know, the Shawns were, you know, integral to Cynic and without them, it's nothing. I don't want to say that because I think that there's still clearly a lot to a lot of musical personality and skill in Paul and the other players on this record that you can get a really good taste of here. And I don't think that the future of those musicians is, you know, unfathomably jeopardized by the death of the Shawns, as tragic and awful as that is. But I do feel to a certain extent like this maybe shouldn't have been a cynic record. I get why it is, because again, it's like, to a certain extent, with the whole like heavenly concept of this record, which I haven't really dug into, but to me it seems to be like there are themes of like spiritualism and like you know live life beyond the physical plane. There, that, that yeah, that's run through that's this definitely a part of it. And so, to a certain extent, because of that, it feels like it's like a tribute to the the passing of um, the Shortens, and it's sort of like a uh, and trying to sort of get in touch with their continued existence in a plane beyond. Live the living realm, which I think Paul is is quite passionate about. I mean, from what I can gather, so there's purpose to it being a cynic project in that sense. But then there's the other side of it where it's like, it, it because of the musical lineage that it calls that it's inevitably tied to by the name cynic. It makes it really difficult to you know not compare it to previous cynic yeah. efforts. And that's where, and I, and I feel mean saying that, but that's because I know there probably might be some Cynic fans discovering this video and watching this who like this record. And so I just want it to be known that I, I've really tried with this album. I appreciate a lot about it, but I do feel that it's not quite as realized as it could have been. And yeah. it's a bit of a shame. I mean, I, I think you're right on point with the, maybe this shouldn't have even been a Cynic record point because... There, there is a part of me that almost feels I would appreciate this a little more if this was some new lineage, but yeah, I mean. Mm. Yeah. Also, this is completely an aside, but I've been calling him Gore Masvidal this whole week. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, Jake, anything uh, you want to uh, add? Uh, well, okay. I was the first one who was like vocal about my opinion of this album in our uh, group chat. And I feel bad because uh, in a stunning turn of events, we have all shifted roles this week and I am become August and August has become Tyler and Tyler has become Morgan um, in our response to a particular album here. And that being that like, I, I basically, I think that all three of us basically evaluate this album exactly the same and broadly have the exact same opinion on it. It's just how what is here affects us that is more um, contributive to our overall like score or final feelings. And as such, the, 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 the highs that you all are talking about for you guys are just substantially less effective with me. Um, Again, I'm not going to be too hard on it because since learning of the context of uh, the deaths of two band members, I mean, I feel like it's a little bit unfair to, you know, fucking tear into this or anything. And, you know, again, th there's obviously a lot of like talent on display here. It's just that like all of the parts feel like they're arranged in the wrong way. And in, in a respect, I completely understand the whole wanting to divorce this from the legacy of Cynic. That said, I think all of the things that connect this to the band are its weakest elements. Like if you just like you would have to abandon most of the core of what makes this album still fit under that umbrella 
to be something new and different. Because even if this was called something else, I don't think I would feel that much differently about it. I will definitely co-sign and say that The Winged Ones is the best song on here for sure. Um, I also think that Elements and Their Inhabitants is is pretty good. I I generally enjoy the first half of the album a little bit more than the second half. Um, It might just be because of the length just kind of makes it feel a bit stolid. Um, The... And, and you know the 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 ambient interlude parts i like like again in theory i don't like in, in fact in theory all of the things that they want to do with ascension codes are things that i want to see done i want someone to take these ambient passages and be able to blend them with this weird new age prog metal shit like because to me or like and putting in the electronic synthesizer stuff that sounds awesome that sounds exactly like the kind of thing i would fuck with and to some extent they've already done that on traced and air i think there are a couple things here that do genuinely hold it back namely the mixing of the the, the big of the guitars as august said is definitely a lot less it's a lot less present and you know mileage may vary it doesn't really work for me um but i can understand why it would work for somebody else for me the biggest problem with the production and like the most individual elements is the vocals themselves and i find that interesting because the thing that is difficult to get on with cynic at least those first two like like classic albums focus and traced in air is that like vocoder vocals and when i say that i mean like vocoder with a capital v that's what it sounds like And I'm wondering if maybe perhaps those earlier records, maybe there was a technological limitation that maybe made those uh, vocals sound the way they did. Whereas here, the vocoder like texture is like gone. The the actual implementation of them just kind of sounds like light, airy, new agey stuff. And I really miss that from Trace Thin Air. Like I want the the presence of that. I don't not saying they have to be like, you know, they're not death metal or anything. They're not like growls. It's they've always been kind of lighter and you know, that might take a bit getting used to, but that's what I enjoyed about Trace Thin Air a lot. And here they just kind of fade into the mix and it makes so much of this album feel completely anodyne especially in that second half particularly on the already mentioned uh worst song on the album uh i have to agree being um dna activation template which is just i mean it's basically them fully leaning into the ambient stuff until like the very end and it's just not dense enough to hold its own weight um all of the things here like again the the keyboard playing or the then like synthesizer stuff that is like the most obvious strength that this has but the way it's produced even drags that down a little bit for me to the point where I just kind of I'm just so tired by the time this is done like the fact that this is a longer record for them does not help in the slightest and it comes off as like if you didn't know the context of this like when I first heard it to me this sounded like they took a bunch of unfinished b-sides and made a record out of it and clearly that's not what they did but it i couldn't blame someone if they mistook it for that it's just an album that fails to leave any kind of impression on me and like i really tried because i didn't like i saw the reception this is getting and it's it's getting good reviews it's it's got like a solid rate your music score i haven't heard anybody like i know talk about it you know and for as much as i don't want to admit it Album art totally plays a um, plays a factor in what you're expecting when you go into an album. I feel like, and this album art here is like cool and grand and awesome. So when going oh, yeah. into this, it's it's so fucking dope. It's yeah. awesome look. It's part of the reason I was so excited for this because it's like ascension exactly. codes, and this is your album art. It's like this fucking like octopus squid fucking thing in the sky. It's overtaking. Fucking- rad yeah and you know you see that and you're just like okay all right and like i don't feel like that informed my opinion on the sound i just feel like that informed my opinion as to the effort because a lot of the times when you get reunion albums like this they're just you know ho-hum gonna make this thing and then it's like them basically on autopilot the whole time and this isn't them on autopilot i genuinely think if they continue to make albums after this they could take everything they're doing here and just improve upon it. They're, this isn't like a, like it's skeletal. They just need to flesh it out. But like, as is, it's just a woefully underwhelming uh, prospect. Like it, it's definitely one of the more disappointing albums of the year for me. Cause no, I don't really think it's good at all. I, I think it dips below being under average for me, but like, I, I still have 
faith because obviously the people in this band are talented. They've done some of the most incredible shit. Like Paul Masvidal, I mean, Jesus Christ. Like you go listen to our fucking death retrospective and listen to us absolutely jizz ourselves about the fucking guitar work on Human. Like he's got talent. He's not fallen off. It, it, It simply is just everything in the world was going against this band for Ascension Codes. And in my opinion, everything in the world really did hold them back. And it's just a shame altogether, really. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I can't take much away from that. I will say I agree with you on the vocal mixing for the most part. And I think the part on the record where the vocals sound the best, ironically, is the one moment where the effects are mostly stripped away entirely, which is for the song Aurora which isn't a great mm, song. Yeah. It's not one of my favorite songs on the record. They still have more presence. You're right. But, but the vocals are, 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 there's less vocoder, oh. there's less effects on the vocals there. And there's some genuinely soulful singing from Masvidal that I found quite moving. So yeah, I think there's a lot of potential. Um, and that, anyway. that soulful singing is, is also, yeah, things done in the past better, but. Yeah, <laughs> true. All right. Well, let's do our favorite tracks and ratings then. Jake, why don't you lead us off? All right, uh, if I had to pick three favorite tracks, The Winged Ones, Elements and Their Inhabitants, and because I don't really like more than those two songs, I'm not gonna pick a third, and I'm just gonna say that like, for as insubstantial as those ambient pieces come off, I like the texture and general atmosphere of like all of them. It's just they don't last long enough to be able to like feel that atmosphere. So I'm just gonna say, that like my third favorite track is a combination of all the ambient interludes into one because if they if they flesh that concept out that sounds like it could be pretty cool maybe um i have faith in you guys uh least favorite track definitely got to be dna template and i give the album a 4.5 all right august favorites are going to be the winged ones uh, architects of consciousness and I, I'll throw in sixth dimensional archetype because I think that song's all right. Uh, least favorite DNA activation template and of all the of all the times we review one of my favorite bands, it's got to be a five point five. I, I hate it when this happens, man. It's basically if you're listening to this, the the t- takeaway here is listen to traced in air. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, focus also. Yeah. yeah, great records. My three favorite tracks are The Winged Ones, Elements and Their Inhabitants, and Architects of Consciousness. Least favorite, say it with me, kids, DNA activation. DNA activation C. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and the album gets a, a I'm going to just go right in the middle of those last two ratings and just give it a flat five. So, Standard deviation going go nuts. So that is an average of 5.0. Um, let's move on, though, to the second album we're going to review today, one which, incidentally, came out a few months ago, but was selected by our Twitter followers in a poll that we put out of albums we missed. Which Follow one at Jam's Teapot on Twitter. Follow. And they chose this album, which is... It's been a big year for all three of these artists, but particularly for one, Paranol, the South Korean shoegaze mastermind who put out an album in March, or February or March of this year called To See the Next Part of the Dream that we still, to this date, stands as one of our most glowing reviews as a group of the entire year in an album that is unquestionably going to place highly on our year-end list video. It is my album of the year. It is August album of the year. It's <laughs> a phenomenal album. Album. And what's so great about it is not just that it's a great album, but it is also a mission statement for a new wave of music, for a new wave of shoegaze, of emo, of post-rock, of black gaze, all of these different genres that have kind of had their moment in new and exciting ways throughout the 2010s, coalescing into this new variant, which excitingly is not this, you know, you know, Western American thing, but has actually been centralized in Eastern Asia with these artists. And Paranol is kind of like the, I don't want to say the mastermind because I'm sure he's probably not the first person or they are probably not the first person to be doing it, but they put it on the global stage with that album. And it's so exciting to see the momentum of this new movement of music being capitalized on so quickly with this new release. 
from these three brilliant artists who I'm sure you'll agree each have their own distinct approach to this sound that they display very well on this record. Uh, you have three tracks from each plus an interlude, an extra interlude that is supplied by Paranormal, but three core tracks from each of these artists that display their distinct strengths, their distinct styles, and also some of the most emotional and heavy and distorted and lush uh, metal and shoegaze that you'll hear this year. Uh, I was admittedly already fully rearing to be in the bag for this before it even before I even listened to it. But even I was surprised at how well this thing hangs together as an album for a record that is essentially three artists supplying songs that they have independently created and then intersplicing them together in this sequence. You know, that should, by all accounts, you know, that there's, it's going to be hard to make that coalesce and cohere into a single unified project. But I think those three artists do it here. It helps that they are all at the top of their game and they are all just sensational. And it helps that they are doing this in a moment where their music, their style feels as vital as it ever has. It's this, the birth of this new thing that I'm so excited about. The future of shoegaze, in my opinion, and to a large extent as well, potentially the future of emo as well. And even Black Ace, who fucking knows? Anyway, I have more detailed thoughts, but I'll reserve them. I want to go straight to August 1st, since he's the person with the most limited time with us today. Or, and also the person who is, besides me, the closest personally to this scene of music. Um, August, what did you think of this record? What do you think of these three distinct artists and their approaches? And how do you think it all comes together on this album? I, I guess, I mean, the first thing that is so obviously apparent about this is how well these three end up working together, but also how distinct they all sound. Because I really only, and you know, on the uh, full acts of this, it doesn't really specify who's who, because I bought this album uh, without even listening to it, because I knew I was gonna love it. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> I mean. I, I think, yeah, and I think the first thing I even did was just sent you those. Yeah, you did. Thank <laughs> yeah. you for that, by the way. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, but what was really impressive about this to me was I really just had to look at who did each track on my first listen of this. Yes. And then, and like hell, I mean, I only really had to look at who did the first three tracks to kind of get the picture sorted out yeah because, the, the sequencing is really yeah. good because you get one track from each of the three artists at the start introduces you yeah. to how they're different and then they get sort of um the the sequencing is a bit more melded after that but yeah yeah and, and that that's such a good way to get you into this because it, it gives you this really great picture of who's doing what on this and yeah, I mean, I love the sequencing first off. It's ridiculously well done. And it feels like something that these three really put some thought and time into. Because for as much as I, I like Paranormal, I think, I think the way that Asian Glow song Nails opens up this album mm. is really good. I mean, it does a trick I'm a sucker for where you have that couple seconds of silence before yep. bursting right into it, which that's such a great decision. I love that decision. And I mean, I, I really love what I like about Asian Glow's songs on here is just how labored his vocals sound, how stressed and like, like to me, he's almost the most traditionally emo feeling artist on this project yeah. because of that and I think that's a really strong quality that sets his songs apart I mean Paranul I guess I'll skip my kind of general thoughts on his contributions because you can guess uh, <laughs> and uh, Sonos Tomam Kanta I think I I am not sure that's right, but I hope it is. Um, Sounds all right. It's as me. close as you can reasonably be expected to do. Without knowing Portuguese. Um, 
uh, his stuff definitely had a little bit more of a like black gaze kind of tinge to it mm. a little heavier it, i found that to i generally i think his contributions were my least favorite ones on here but that's also not at all a knock because they're still very very good i i mean i think everyone's playing firing on all cylinders as much as they can for the most part in all of these songs i find the just blunt brutal mixes to be immaculate and I mean, Paranormal songs like fucking Colors. God damn. Oh, I'll be talking about that. Don't you worry. Yeah. No, that's that's just that's one of the best songs Paranormal has done outside of the context of this. It's so mm -hmm. it's so fucking good. It's just the prettiest most ethereal and at the same time heaviest shit on here i mean the biggest triumph of this record is that to see the next part of the dream is now one of my 25 25 30 favorite albums ever like it's just built its way up to that point throughout the year and this these songs that he contributes here made me feel like he was holding back on that album right uh, dude like, has not reached his final form like um yeah i mean i won't front colors is my favorite song that he's put out to date uh, i i think it is it beautifully displays everything that's so enamoring about his style it, it has enough variation surprises progression and individually gorgeous instrumental elements to reward the dozens of listens i've given it when that little sort of piano motif breaks through the noise and then the song just entirely transforms in its second half, that's to me what elevates this artist. It takes the song from something that's already fantastic to something that is astronomically gorgeous and, and, and evokes that kind of feeling that these artists are all about, right? That kind of feeling of sort of transcendent catharsis that this music is all about putting into you. Like that, that feeling of like, I'm leaving my fucking body. And, and that does yeah. it to me. And I, I mean, what's, what's so brilliant about it is that capturing that catharsis and that depression at the same time, that just, I mean, that's, the, that's something that I think needs to be said, that for as cathartic as this can be, it's also like, it's very gloomy and bleak at points. It's... Mm -hmm. uh, like some of this stuff, like Love Migraine in particular, and I think is, act, no, all of those like la that, that last run of like that Asian Glow song, Vento, Carmina, Comigo, One May Be Harming, and Love Migraine, they all kind of bust out their, their big closer kind of song on this. Those are just gut-wrenching, I find. Yeah, I, I think... That's kind of the appeal of this niche of music, right? Is that it takes that inherent gloominess and depressiveness of emo, right? And it just makes it into this big, huge, cathedral-sized, cathartic thing where you can just kind of... I think that was... One thing that can't be understated is how indebted these artists, particularly Sonos Tomam Conta, are to Deaf Heaven, who I think... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, Sonos Tomam Conta's songs are so reminiscent of like sunbather to yeah me. i was gonna like, say and it's so rooted in that like even his kind of like clean picked guitar tones that he has in the quieter parts of his songs are like straight off of sunbather but like beyond that more broadly deaf heaven was like is the clearest predecessor or antecedent to this movement of music i think because it was about that it was about taking those aspects of metal and those aspects of shoegaze and turning up the catharsis level making it into something that you can use to take all of your lowest and, and worst emotions and turn them into something that's so fucking radiant that it explodes out of your mouth like a ball of fire like it's it's hard to put it into more sensible words than that but that's the appeal of this niche of music is that it does that it makes you feel that kind of catharsis where your the intensity of your emotions becomes triumphant in a certain sense 
And what's really amazing about this record is the way that it does that. They do that through, you know, both lengthy and involved and dense songs, like my favorite um, Sonhos Toam Kanto contribution here, which is Todos o Sonhos Ke U TV, which is the third track on this record, his first contribution, which is one of the ones that most resembles Deaf Heaven to me. Uh, incredible uh, sonic density, like long track, lots going on, kind of overwhelms you. But you also have, like, essentially Paranul's first contribution, Insomnia here. I mean, it's almost a pop song. Like, it almost feels like a uh, pop song. August, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about here. That fucking Insomnia sounds like it is the best anime intro you've never heard. Oh, yeah. That's a great comparison. Those a little, like, the little, the world is a beautiful place. I'm no longer afraid to die. Bubbly synths in that song oh, are yeah, just yeah. And, fucking and it's, terrific. It's a trick that, and there's, and there's of, course, of course, the piano motif, which is a trick he has pulled a lot of times, multiple times on this record and on his own record, where he has, he has this knack for doing these piano, whether they're samples or whether they're just motifs that he records. And they're just like the most classic sounding little melodies on a piano that you could you've mm -hmm. ever heard and they're integrated into the mix of the songs and they add so much to the mel melodic core of the songs and the intensity and the emotion of it all that it's like and also like they are the pop glue that makes the song because like the first two songs on this record are like four minutes they're like tight they're punchy and insomnia is the best of them in my opinion it just absolutely agree if you were to introduce, I think if you wanted to introduce Paranormal or even this whole scene to someone who's completely not versed in it and you don't want to overwhelm them too much, a song like Insomnia would be a really good way to do it, I think. Um, because it just, it, it, it's the friendliest that this gets while also giving you a truthful picture of how emotionally potent and cathartic and glorious it can be. I can't really say much more that Tyler and August haven't already put just because they're obviously the, the, the experts here, but... I, yeah, I got a cosign Insomnia. Um, that's my favorite Paranormal song I've heard thus far, frankly. Um, I, uh, it literally, like, testament to the year that we're having that that only just, just made my best songs of the year list. Um, but that said, this, like, this is also, like, refreshing in a sense because it's, like, I think we can all agree that the particularly rough and often kind of abrasive production of to see the next part of the dream is one of its greatest strengths that said the production here is noticeably i mean like for as much as it can be with this kind of music is noticeably easier on the ears and it's nice to know that like you don't have to like that not only was the production on that album like a very specific choice with an intention but when you move away from that he's still perfectly capable of making something that evokes that same kind of like melancholy, but without that like particular sound, like everybody on here, like for a black gaze project or for all of the genres this draws from, this is a pretty like easy on the ears listen. Um, even for the, like the Sonho songs, like that are noticeably like the most, like the drums on that first one are so blown out. They're so compressed, but as a result, they feel textural which is one of the best parts of this through like it, if you told me that this album was a paranormal album that where he only just occasionally got like some contributors to help him out with some songs i believe you just because this is about as cohesive as a triple sp uh, split lp is capable of feeling and sounding uh, even if it does all come from the same scene and I guess what's super remarkable about it is the way you can tell each instrumental choice on all three of these band songs feels like it was slaved over as to how each individual instrument sounds. It's like the way, the, the level and the way to which something can be compressed or not compressed, uh, how far back it is in the mix. All of these feel almost progressively slaved over as a, an active choice. It's never like a thing where, you know, it's never mindless. You can feel like everything here is done with intent and the intent is always successful. I don't think there's like a noticeable drag on here, frankly. Like I just, yeah, I don't even have like a least favorite song just because I feel like they're all so of at peace with each other. And that sort of melancholy that you all talked about that it harnesses of like taking that and making it euphoric, making it cathartic. And I don't just make the world is a beautiful place comp just because of those synths. I think that that feeling and that sameness 
um, is, is totally of a piece with that band. I compared um, the Paranormal album when we talked about it, I compared it to Whenever If Ever. And I think that that is even more comparable here, frankly. I mean, this album and thematically and in just the kind of emotions that you feel and illusory walls from this year evoke that same kind of feeling in me, which is just this profound sense of turning musically, of turning pain into euphoria which of course is gonna fucking you know that's gonna be a good hit on this podcast amongst the three of us closer love migraine is also something like briefly shouted out that i think is like the perfect song to end this album with it's just it, i i think i even prefer uh, to see the next part of the dream is the better album albeit in my opinion only narrowly but i guess that's just more of a like I guess this scene makes me think of like Slint's Spiderland in the sense that I feel like a bunch of young people just decided to make some music with the means they had available to them and are going to end up spearheading this underground genre for the next decade. And I just want to be around for the next decade of music. Yeah. If it's anything like Slint, people won't <laughs> care until the next decade. Yeah, fucking exactly. Well, we're in the internet age now, which yeah, exactly. weren't, so exactly. that makes a big difference. One thing that I will would have say, been fucking a black midi if the internet was around. One thing I will say that I, I think might appeal to certain people is like, one of the strengths of this album that I think maybe the reason Jake likes it so much is like the, the three artists complement each other in really nice ways. And also like the, the interspersing of these songs gives you like a sense of variation across the album. Like you're not necessarily within a consistent yes. mode like you are on the Paranormal album. And if that Paranormal album, if, if that, and I'm speaking to our listeners here, if that Paranormal album didn't fully click for you, because I know it hasn't fully clicked for, for, for a few of my friends, if it was a little too much of the same thing for too long for you, Listen to this, because I think there's a strong chance if you feel that way about the Paranormal record, you'll like this more. Uh, yes. I think the, the variation on this, while I agree with Jake that I, I obviously like the Paranormal album more, I think it's the best cohesive statement. I think the variation here will really appeal to people who like certain aspects of the sound, but want to see it explored in more depth. Yes. So I think this will really appeal to those people. Uh, a couple of things I want to shout out that I haven't mentioned already. Uh, I haven't really talked about my feelings on Asian Glow, but Asian Glow is probably like, if I had to rank the three artists, the one I don't love the most, I, I, it goes Paranormal and Son Host and Asian Glow for me. But all three of Asian Glow's songs are great here, particularly yes. uh, One May Be Harming, which I absolutely love. My favorite contribution from him on this record uh, it demonstrates some of the record's best um, command of loud, quiet dynamics. Uh, it's an incredibly intense performance from this artist. One of the things that makes this artist distinct from the other two is the subtle but definitely present incorporation of electronic elements into their sound, which from what I hear is more prevalent on their 2021 album, Carl Fickle, which I haven't gotten around to yet, but I've heard a lot of really good things about, so I'm going to listen to that soon. Um, but it also has, even compared to the other two artists, and Paranormal is definitely influenced by this as well, but Asian Glow's songs also have kind of an indie rock element to some of the strumming of the guitars and some of the melodies and tonalities that they flirt with. Very clear indie rock ref reference, which melds well with the emo stuff too. I mean, this song, One May Be Harming, even has a fucking sex solo in it, mm -hmm. which I feel like, I mean holy shit it's so well integrated too it's fucking gorgeous uh love that shit and then love migraine this was a like i mean what a closing track this is what i love about this is the traces of paranormal's like affinity for you know western music and like you know american pop music and indie rock and shoegaze and all that sort of stuff filters through all the music he's made but what i love here is like the key changes in this song and there are quite a few of them are like they remind me so much of like pop ballad american music like you know mariah carey and celine dion sort of shit like how they will do like a, a real hearty sort of ballad and then they'll just like add a key change at the climax of the song and it'll just kind of lift it up to another level that's almost a pop cliche in america and i and i like the way that Paranul does this in the context of this really heavy shoegazy emo rock song and he does these um key changes on his re repetitions of the chorus that feel so much like taken from that um tradition and it's like such an awesome thing because it adds this whole like new level to his music 
uh, on this song where like the key changes are like another way that he takes your breath away as you're listening to the song like it, it's a gorgeous amazing synth beds on this track too uh just mm. an, an absolutely perfect song i think all three of paranormal songs here are perfect and i mean an amazing artist uh i even think that the shorter moments on this record while they don't maybe last in the memory as much as the longer moments still really hold up i want to shout out tom's day azul the shortest shortest track from sonos tom and conta which has uh showcases a really strong command of his black gaze influence style i love the loping ascending descending bass melody in this track gives it a real sense of rhythmic heft that you aren't sort of expecting uh, and Sonhos Komam Tonta, who I think has the most vocal range of the three artists in the sense that sometimes yeah. he is singing tunefully and other times he's leaning right into that, you know, black metal-esque screaming. Uh, that range is used to great effect on his songs, uh, especially the songs that mix the two of them. Um, but yeah, when he's really kind of doing that at its most growly and intense, I'm, 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 I'm fucking tired in the bag for that. It reminds me again. Very lead singer of All Say to me. Like, yeah, it um, reminds Madonna me exactly. Exactly. In 2013, I went through a phase where I got really into Deaf Heaven. I got really into Agalock. I got really into All Say. And it take, listening to this artist in particular it takes me right back to that period and the nostalgia that I have for that so yeah amazing amazing record uh, and I want to say one more thing which is I, I shouted out this scene but I want to give a little more specific detail is that these three artists are all on the same label and it's a label called Longinus Records Longinus in, Records Longinus my bad based in Michigan you'd know that if you watch David Gellion <laughs> I was thinking that Okay, I hear I mean, their logo is Shinji in yeah, that. Well, there you go. So that, Wait, that, really? Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> that will tell you as a listener if this label will appeal to you. But there are four uh -huh. artists, only four artists on this label on their band camp, and three of them are the artists on this record. So uh, the other artist is a Swedish artist called Dating or Dating, which I haven't listened to yet, but I want to go and listen to as well. So I intend over this summer to get really into all of these artists and dive through their catalogs because they have their, their albums have really, really great ratings and reviews online as well. And I can sense an obsession bubbling. So <laughs> like any of this music, go on Bandcamp, go and look up Long Genus, Ginus, Genus, whatever it is. And Long Vagina. And, and follow them on Bandcamp and dig into some of these releases because most, if not all of them, are pay what you want anyway. So they're really easy to get into um, and support them because this is... If you support get, all your favorite artists this year. Do I, it. I, I absolutely. And I said this in the Paranormal video. I feel like we're on the ground floor here and we're going to see many, many more of these artists. And this is going to be a label to watch and people are going to look back on records like this. Incidentally, shout out to the fucking Sai Ming Lang-esque album title that we have here, Downfall of the Neon Youth. Love I was going to say, that had to be a Sai Ming Lang reference. Like, there's, I cannot see it being a way it's not. Yeah, I like, mean, it, it has the vibe of, like, you know, his first movie, Rebels of the Neon God. It reminded That's, me. yeah, that was um, the one. But, yeah, uh, so... Get in on the ground floor, check out these artists, and we will be following them as in the years to come. All right. Well, good then. record to end the year off on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Favorite tracks and ratings. Uh, I'll go first, reverse order this time. My three favorite tracks are Colors, um, Todos os Sonhos que u tive, or I don't, I don't it's Portuguese, so I probably butchered that. And I will put in third place, um, I'll give one from each artist. So my third place pick will be one maybe harming. Um, least favorite, if I had to pick one, um, I, I still really, really like this track. It's just maybe the least great of the main tracks in this record. And that's Phone Ringing on Corridor. Um, yeah. Still a really good song. Um, and yeah, the album is getting a fucking 9.5 from me. I am. Yes. August. Uh, so my three favorites here are going to be, in no particular order, one from each artist, uh, Nails, Colors, and Vento Carminha Comigo, which I thought that song was awesome. Least favorites of the main ones, not counting 70 Seconds Before Sunrise, which probably the worst thing on here by virtue of not being a lot probably Tons de Azul. 
Either way, this grape, uh, eight out of 10. Three favorite tracks for me, gotta go with Insomnia, uh, one of the best songs of the year, my opinion. Uh, gotta go with Colors and gotta go with Love Migraine. Uh, least favorite, I'll co-sign August Saint-Tons Day Azul, mainly because it's sandwiched between two in fucking credible songs and just comes off as a, as a bit lesser. Um, and yeah, I give the album an eight. That's an average of 8.5, a really strong way to finish the year. In fact, I can probably chuck in Morgan as well because he gave it an eight on Radio Music. Yep. So, so uh, presumably. So it brings it down a bit to 8.4, but still a really respectable rating. Um, and I, I'm really stoked that our audience chose this album because it is a really, I, I figured it would be a pretty unifying uh, opinion sort of thing and brings us full circle really nicely. Cole Fickle in Asian Glow's words. So that's our last episode of the main show for the year. But of course we have a record club coming in a couple of days on Sophie's Oil of Every Pearl's Un Insights. And next week as well as a special video, which will be premiering on Thursday and teasing closer to the time, we will be releasing our, we'll be beginning our list videos next Sunday with the worst songs and albums of the year. We'll be releasing those videos from Sunday onward. And then the best the week after that so plenty more stuff coming from the channel Just because this is the last main episode we you are you will not be hurting for content this no month. we have a lot planned just for this month and beyond in terms Too of main much. episodes because people do seem to love the main episodes we will be back uh i think the first day we'll be back is going to be the second of january in terms of releases for main episodes so we'll be back with the main show then but as we've said lots of stuff coming in the interim so yeah stick around for that let us know in the comments below what you think of the albums we've reviewed today cynics ascension codes and this downfall of the neon youth crossover let us know what these records mean to you if you disagree with us on anything let us know your perspective in the comments below if you like what we do and you want to support us then well, the biggest thing you can do is uh, hit the like and hit the subscribe button because the both of those things really help us but if you want to go a little bit further you can hit the join button and for just a buck you can support us and become gain access to some perks and get your name shouted out in every video that we release as well which we i am making a point to do now so if that sounds like something that would appeal to you if you like what we do and want to support us there's that option too in the coming year we plan on fleshing out those tiers a little bit too so yeah. you can get even yeah. more so we're definitely going to be getting more ambitious and doing more with our perks so don't worry about that but yeah that's basically it for this one august do you want to send us out of course as always everyone Rock over London, rock on Chicago, Sprite, obey your thirst. <laughs>